and this uh, Condado Lagoon as our paddlers are setting their mark and getting ready to go. Final instructions given by Anthony Vela, our contest director, and we are a go. Men's distance race, 18 kilometers. See Polar Bear. See T2. Kind of two packs are spreading out. You got a pack on the right and a pack on the left. They're all funneling into the right-hand side. Looks like Michael Booth out in the lead right there. Just like Drew said, to be expected of Michael to get that early lead. Great sprinter as well. Now, Boothy looks like he's in second. That could be T2 out in front. Nice long strokes. And we'll start to see this crew divide a little bit. And interesting to note, the back of the boards dipping so low as they're putting so much pressure, so much energy into these beginning strokes with the sprint off the line. And the right pack is being met up with the left pack. The left pack is trying to merge their way behind these guys. Great tactics to start things off and to get those opening trains formed as the pack heads towards the bridge. Roughly about eight minutes separating the prone paddle start and the sub paddle start. And there we can see the paddle boarders, the prone paddle, now passing through the harbor and heading out into the ocean. They're going straight past the San, Ge San Geronimo Fort and they'll start heading towards the left up the coastline. As we can see our stand-up paddlers starting to separate as they come towards the bridge. A minute 50 seconds into the sup distance racing and we'll be here for a while. It's gonna be a long race. They know that they're in for it, but they've been training so hard and these are Olympic level athletes. The paddlers in this event this year have been training so hard, their endurance is so high. It's going to be amazing to see who comes out on front to see what kind of times they're able to pull through, especially with this wind that's come into factor as we see those prone paddlers starting to head out towards that first buoy. Yeah, this pack, um, you know, is gonna be really solid. These guys are starting out with a sprint to get under the bridge. And then once they get out in the ocean, I foresee, you know, a couple of who's going to take the inside, who's going to go on the outside. There's going to be different strategies. They watched the women's race and they saw how they were attacking the course. And the men, there could be, you know, little teams, you know, some starboard teams, some country teams teaming up here, working with each other, trying to find, you know, the right and the shortest way to get through. That's right. Getting into those team rhythms. And that's what we saw on the women's race that was completed about an hour ago for Team Spain, specifically in the SUP distance racing for Duna and Esperanza, who didn't have that plan from the start as Duna was sharing with us here in the booth. But as it would happen, they ended up traveling together and they stayed together for so long, helped each other to get the uh, distance lead ahead of the rest of the paddlers. All right, we got a pack of five right here heading out um, into the ocean on the north side of the harbor. You can see the swells around. They'll be making a left-hand buoy turn here, then they'll be paddling towards Fiji Rock, where the technical race was, and also our sup surfing for both men and women. So very interesting. It was a pack of eight, now it's a pack of five in the lead. Rounding that first buoy, picking up as Drew was saying with just maybe a little bit of wind behind them now as it's blowing towards the west. And you can see some of them on their knees in that sprint style and others in the prone position as a very long train has formed. Yeah, the, for train, our stand -up paddlers. the train is kind of separating of just a little bit. We've got to have two trains here. But it's still, it's still early days right here in this race. We're just uh, four and a half minutes into the stand-up men's distance 18K and 12 and a half minutes in for the men for the prone paddleboard. And, they, and they're now starting to pass underneath the bridge in that 
in that S form and just setting that pace. Looks beautiful. You can see how glassy and clear it is as they're coming just under the bridge now and beginning to emerge. A pack of four, five, six there right in front, Bo. Yeah, they're all following. Let's go down and check in with Drew. Drew, what do you see? Thank, thanks, guys. Coming to you live from the boat right now. A very fast start for our prone paddleboarders. It was Spain, France, USA, and with Hunter Fluger out in front in that lead pack, but very bunched up, but moving very, very fast down the coastline. It almost feels like a downwinder on this downwind leg, which would, should create some very exciting action. And just behind us, our stand-up paddlers are gonna be coming out of the harbor through these big swells coming in and out of the, what they call the mouth or the jaws area of this area of this particular position. But all of the fans set up on the outer rock over there cheering on their teams as they come across. It's a very exciting time. And guys, this should be a very fast distance race today with the downwig leg and then the current coming back in through the channel. These guys should flat fly. Again, we're waiting to see who will be the first one to exit the channel here as a lot of people saying Michael Booth is out in front, but you can see they're all bunched up and a lot of rail rubbing out there as they come out and really start stretching their legs on this downwind leg. So we'll take a look, we'll follow them live, and here they come. Thanks so much, Drew. I can see Boothy, he's on the right on the star bar. I see Shrimpy, he's kind of breaking away on the left. He's wearing the white hat and the striped uh, shorts, black and white. So, you know, the big dogs are going out there, and Shrimpy is now an officially, you know, a gold medal world champion. You know, he's not competing in the juniors. He wants this, and if he could go double, double, tech and distance, that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be insane, and to see him out in front for the start of it means that he's regained the energy. He's had a couple of days off, didn't compete on the SUP surfing, which means three days to rest between winning his gold medal in the sub technical race. He didn't need to. His teammates made a second place and fourth place in the men's and women's sub surfing. That's right. Team Japan did an incredible job on that side with Kaede and Taka Inoue on the men's and women's side to take away medals there. And they'll be gaining some very valuable points for their team, specifically heading into finals day on Sunday for us as we get a closer look at our front racers for the sub distance paddle. Yeah, it looks like uh, Noeek is right there. I thought it was Shrimpy, but that's Noeek next to Michael Booth. And Drew, what are you looking at now? Drew, can you hear us? What can you see there from the boat? Out in front, Tituan Puyo just behind him with Noeek just on the outside. And then the Japanese rider, Shrimpy just behind them in the green hat as they bunch up. We should start to see them come into more draft-like position and start stringing out as they exit the channel here. You see some big sets on the outer edge, which once they blast through that and head westerly, we'll start to see those draft trains form. There's your update. Thanks so much, Drew. Okay, Michael Booth in first. We can see the two Frenchmen in second and third. That's uh, Tichuan Puyo and Noeek Garriou. And then out behind them, uh, we see Shrimpy. 16 minutes on the clock for our paddle distance race out in front there. And they're just passing by. Look at these outer rocks there, creating a little bit of chaos in the lineup. And that's going to mess up that rhythm that that front pack had. As they approach Fiji Island, there are those couple of rocks cropping out and it's really difficult to see them until the waves actually pass a little bit lower that rock pops out and that's where we saw that pack of uh prone paddlers just nearly get taken out by that set yeah in this pack is two-time gold medalist hunter fluger for team usa david buell he's in there from team spain julian from um france is in this group and i believe andrea from Italy is also in this group. Trying to pick out which one is which because these guys are just some more behind this group. He's trying to catch the lead pack. There we go, group of five. And there you can see those tactics of just trailing behind each other and how helpful it is. Our paddler on the yellow board, just taking a few strokes and then able to just drift behind the paddler in the front 
And it's just carrying him along there. The little currents that are created behind these paddle boards, they just pull that person next in line behind. Yeah, there's some uh, still water on the back of the tail. And so you, you want to get your nose as far up as you can, but you don't really want to bump and, and possibly, you know, injure your board or their board because uh, that's just unsportsmanship. But these guys are working together. They're cruising all on their knees. Great technique. You see water bottles attached to the uh, front end of the prone paddleboard. And the next pack coming around, Fiji Rock. Been a great race so far. We can see the wind that's come into play. And it's just giving that little bit of a breeze behind these paddlers, making it slightly easier for them to, to gain some speed as they now hit this very long straightaway bow towards the harbor. Yeah, they're kind of splitting up here. We're going to bring in gold medalist from the women's tech earlier this week, Candace Appleby, a double qualifier into the Pan Am Games. How sweet is that? I'm pretty stoked. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, pretty sweet. <laughs> no, but um, you've won this distance race in the ISA. What are these athletes going through? Um, you know, it's, it's about, you know, managing your course, right? Managing your energy, trying to get in the draft pack and utilize the draft best you can be smart um, making sure if you're in a pack that you're you know conserving energy and also making sure everybody else takes their turn but if you have a specialty like the open ocean um, that's when you're going to try to break away right somebody like shrimpy or noik tituan Boothy, they all have great open ocean skills so um, that's an opportunity to you know to break the pack essentially and you can see these guys, they're not really drafting too much in the open ocean. Maybe Shrimpy's got a little side draft on Boothie right now, but they're gonna do everything that they can to try to get some sort of a separation maybe going into the next flat section. We're seeing Michael Booth in the lead, Shrimpy in second place, uh, Noik, or is that T2? That looks like T2 on, yeah. on the NSP there. And um, I'm sure Noik isn't too far behind. But there's a lot of water moving out there. And um, so, like, he, you see Shrimpy here. He's really working hard to keep up with these guys, but also utilize the ocean. Shrimpy is so, I mean, all these guys are great at reading the water. But I'm, I'm pretty fascinated with Shrimpy. <laughs> he's uh, one of my favorite paddlers, for sure. And I saw on your Instagram you picked him up and twirled him like a baton. <laughs> yeah, I was so excited. <laughs> I've known him since he was a really little boy. And... And um, it's just so cool to see him doing so well. And I got a chance to talk to his dad um, back in July at the U.S. Open. And I said, hey, are you doing his, writing his training programs? Because his father, Takuji, is a, is a surf lifesaver. And he's got tons of ocean experience. And I said, what are you doing for his programs? You know, maybe you can write mine. <laughs> and he said, you know, we don't really, you know, we don't really write a specific program or do intervals like, like a lot of other people, he said, if there's wind, we downwind. If there's waves, we go in the surf. If there's flat water, we do speed. And if there's nothing, we'll go lay net and catch fish. And, and he was explaining to me that the way that he reads the water from fishing helps him read the water for his paddling. And it's just really cool that it's a, that waterman lifestyle that they live. And that's the, the way that he trains pretty uh, intuitively with the ocean. And you can see they're passing us right now. Uh, you got a couple surfers on the lineup. Yeah, that's amazing to hear, you know, that, that perspective of, of being ocean-minded already and then applying your sport within that. He already has so much knowledge of that, and for yourself as well or for so many of these paddlers, that if they don't need to approach the sport and learn what the ocean is like and then try to apply their paddling to it, it would be so much easier, and that's where it seems like we've seen Shrippy come out on top. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of the ocean athletes really shine, specifically at these ISA events, because we're always somewhere where there's going to be waves, right? And the paddles are mostly out in the open ocean. So there's lots of different races around the world that are in flat water and um, different locations, but all of the ocean athletes and watermen and waterwomen are the ones that are definitely going to excel at these ISA world championships explain the two types of boards that we're seeing we're seeing the dugout and we're seeing more of a conventional board that that, that you're running you know a flat deck yeah there's a lot of the dugouts 
You can see Shrimpy really putting in a big effort here to get away from these guys. But um, a lot of paddlers are using the dugouts nowadays, especially in the open ocean and the downwind, or even in the flat water. When there's more, um, you know, I guess, uh, treacherous conditions with waves, I think that the flat deck boards um, are beneficial because you can really move around on the board. But I'm kind of old school. I want the board to be as much like a surfboard as possible. This right here is a traditional prone paddle board from New Zealand. And you'll see that there's straps up and down the board. So this allows the rider to be able to scoot back on the board, belly ride, and hang their body off the back of the board when it's a, a really deep wave and a critical section. So those back straps there will help, uh, help a paddler to just hang their body off the back and almost kind of bodyboard the wave. Well, that way with they the surf don't life saving uh, events, you know, they're into the shore break they're into, so they need handles everywhere because they, they get knocked off their board so many times. Yeah, with the traditional paddle boards, you'll see two different styles. You'll see um, the more flat water pintail design with a round bottom, like the barks. There's a lot of barks on the water, those are really fast. I'd say those are the fastest designs. And then you'll see the more square tail with a lot of the lifeguard straps boards that come from New Zealand and Australia. And right here we have a really cool drone shot of the whole field. You can see lots of separation in the pack, a lot of water moving. You see surface texture kind of flowing right behind the paddlers, but then you can see a current that kind of moves a little bit from the right to the left of the screen. So um, the drone shot always makes it look a lot easier than it really is. Um, but it's a lot of moving water out there for these athletes. Yeah, and every time we do get that shot from the boat, you can just see how much water there is moving on the surface. We don't quite have white caps yet. I would expect by the end of the race, we'll probably have the wind that strong that we'll start to see some white caps. But here you can tell just how much texture there is on the surface. Yeah, there's a lot of water moving. And so these athletes are gonna wanna manage, um, manage you know, for their fatigue too. Typically most paddlers have a strong side, have a weaker side. And depending on which way that wind or swell is coming from, you know, uh, it's going to favor your stronger or your weaker side. So you want to make sure that you are proactive instead of kind of reactive in your, your course that you're going to set. So that way you can conserve energy in advance. Now we're seeing T2 out in the lead there. And Shrimpy's to his left and Boothy's to his right. So these guys aren't working together. No, they're not working together. They're you know, trying to, it's, it's really hard when the water's moving like that You to, to draft. Sometimes it would take a little bit more effort actually. So you either want to stay within striking distance for when you get in the flats, you can be working together or you want to get away, right? So, um, you know, all three of these guys are really great at reading the open water. Tituan, you know, is a great downwind paddler as is Shrimpy and Boothy. So, you know, Boothy's really going to fare well in the flat water, especially because he's so strong. But um, these other two guys are definitely going to give him a run and in the just, open water. Yeah, Candice, you just saw Shrimpy just duck in his hat to cool himself off. And, you know, we're into, what, about 2K into the race. And so the heat's getting to him early. Uh -huh. It's <laughs> you got to definitely manage your hydration in advance. This is a race where you're hydrating all week long. You're, you know, you're drinking and, and taking electrolytes two days before to make sure that you're ready for race day. Can you talk to us about paddles and what they might be using out there today? Yeah, so um, Tituan and Shrimpy are definitely using a quick blade. I'm sure Michael is, a, he, I don't want to say he's either on a starboard paddle or he may have his own paddle brand um, by now. So, but I know that Tituan and Shrimpy are using quick blades. Um, T2 is probably using the 85. It's called a T2, <laughs> which is a, the 85 is the size of the blade. And that is a blade that has a slight dihedral down the backside of the blade. And then here we go. We have our prone paddlers. And it looks like there is a little pack. Yeah, this is Hunter our leading Fluger. pack right now. Yeah, it started with a pack of eight. And then by the time they got the Fiji rock, it was a pack of five. Now the lead group is a pack of three. We got Hunter Fluger in the lead. And he's a past gold medalist twice twice and he's just coming off of a big trip to Tahiti where he was doing outrigger so it was uh, several days of multiple channel crossings and paddling with his outrigger team and uh, he was out there with Danny Ching as well was with him and Hunter's a beast um, he's uh, definitely coming here fit and ready 
when he's pulling that train, he's, I don't think he's going to, he's going to be pretty smart. He's not going to overwork himself, and he's most likely going to communicate and say, hey, it's your turn. Yeah, he's a two-time distance winner in China and in El Salvador. So we are 27 minutes into the prone race and 20 minutes into the stand-up race. I'm Bo Hodge along with Shannon Hughes. We've got our three-time gold medal tech Candace Appleby with us in the studio. Now, Candace, what was your decision to not compete in the distance racing, which you've also got a couple of gold medals in this year, and go for different disciplines instead? Um, yeah, so it's hard to do everything. Yeah, <laughs> very. <laughs> when we come to this event, we don't know the exact order of the events that are going to take place. So right, as far as your day-to-day -day schedule, what, what events yeah, will you Yeah, we don't win? know what's going to happen first, and my ultimate goal was to double qualify for subsurf and tech racing and so I just decided I didn't even try out at our nationals because sometimes you try out and then you get kind of like roped into doing it right, right. so I'm if like if I don't try out they second. can't even rope me into doing it yeah not that I don't want to I mean today you know my other events were done and it would have been fun to be out there with those girls but we have such strong paddlers from our country and it's just really cool to to see other people do things too I don't need to do everything and um but yeah my my reasoning was just so that I could focus, focus on subsurf, focus on the technical race, and then I will be doing the relay. Okay, great. Yeah. And that's amazing to know that you could kind of plan ahead for that, knowing that for sub tech racing and for sub surfing, that the Pan American Games were on the cards, that you had that qualification to look for, which you knew you weren't going to be able to qualify. We won't be taking any distance powers to the Pan American Games. Exactly. And so to have that focus ahead of time would have set you up well for preparation for this. Yeah, and so I'm excited, and we're going to have a fun, uh, fun relay team too. We had a little bit of a switch at the last minute. A Liz Hunter, our prone paddler is taking off early Sunday morning so I'm actually going to be doing the prone leg for our team okay which is fun I love prone paddle boarding and so um we'll have Hunter he'll be he'll lead us off and then April who's a world champion sprinter which is right in her wheelhouse she'll uh, be doing this up I'll do the prone and then we'll have Campbell Carter who is our junior be uh, our anchor for the sup oh that's great portion. and will you then have to be pa borrowing a board from somebody yeah I'll probably borrow Liz's board I think she's leaving it behind to sell it so you can nice. see these guys here. They're actually getting a couple bumps. Um, and Hunter is just kind of like taking it easy here a little bit because he knows he's being drafted. He's utilizing, utilizing the bumps. He's probably talking right now like, okay, who's, who's ready to pull? Or if not, he's not going to overexert himself um, when he's up in the front. You can really see he's just taking a couple strokes and then getting a couple glides because he knows, you know, it's uh, you want to be smart. You want to manage it well and... You know, sometimes you can be in a pack and other people don't want to take a turn. So if that's the case, then, you know, slow the pace and not overexert yourself. Right. And taking a turn, you mean literally by switching that lead position because the paddler in the front is carrying the weight for the group? Yeah. So typically, you know, you could be paddling at 80% effort of the person in front of you. Say they're at 100% effort, you're at 80% effort and you're utilizing their draft. But in a situation like this, if you can get a little, a couple glides and connect a few bumps, you might be able to break the pack. Like these two guys, you know, just broke um, the third place paddler and they're gonna try to stretch it out if they can so that way he can't get back on their draft. So good. Well, we've uh, excused Bo Hodge for a few minutes and we brought Ben Way back into the booth to talk through some of the action. Uh oh, ben. watch out. Oh. <laughs> so here I am with my two favorite people next to Bo Hodge, of course. So, yeah, I'm great to, uh, very grateful to have you here, Champy Pants, Candace Appleby. Thank you. That's my favorite nickname that I've ever made for anyone, and I heard it sticking. It's sticking. How my many my mom doesn't you? like it, though. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mom. <laughs> it's okay, um, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we love joking around. The vibes are always high as we see some beautiful background here. And I don't mind it, though. No, there, right where all those beautiful colors are. Do you know why that's famous, Candace? I do not. Why? Okay, so do you remember the song Despacito? Yes, That's because Luis I've hung out Fonzie with Itzel and Delgado. Daddy Yankee. <laughs> and so that was, this town is famous. It brought this place, 2017 is when they filmed that. And up until the filming of that, they colorized all of the buildings. There was murals painted. It made it really colorful to make it very recognizable in that video. And since then, they have had so much more income or um, influx of tourism the economy's been better, and there is, this is one of my favorite places in town. It's built by the Spanish, 
I've spent tons of time in Galicia, Spain. Very, very similar when you look at the buildings. Every house has balconies. People have open doors to their complete house as you're walking by to the public. It's beautiful. Wow. And we went to um, an ex-pro surfer from Puerto Rico who's uh, Tochi Digital, and he makes uh, NFTs. His name's Charlie Ramirez. We went to the Lighthouse Gallery for his um, exhibition yesterday. It was really cool. Surfers, everybody mixed together. And there is the castle, 500-year-old castle. And that is the Castillo San Felipe del Morro off to the right of our screen. And here we have our leaders. Hunter Fluger from the USA, Julian Marti Corena from France, and Andrew Newton of New Zealand. So fourth, or fourth and fifth are pretty close behind. We had a really big spread in our earlier heat where we had um, Japan and Spain basically neck to neck the whole race. And now we're seeing a little bit of chop, a little bit of wind conditions, kind of mixing things up, which adds a little bit of spice. Um, Candice, what would you say as far as the glassy conditions compared to the choppy conditions? Does that kind of mix it up and, and help the, the field get a little bit closer? Yeah, I mean, I think the choppy conditions break the, break the pack up a little bit, right? Because you're trying to catch those open ocean glides, trying to utilize every bit of ocean that you can. You can see a little bit of a separation between the top three uh, paddlers, but T2 and Shrimpy are still pretty close together. Looks like Michael's just kind of taking his time back there a little bit. Not so much taking his time, but just he looks very calm and composed. He doesn't look like he's um, worked up at all about the fact that he's in that third position. He's still well within striking distance, and you know these guys are just taking their time. You can see totally different styles of paddling. You got T2 with the longer stroke. And then Shakuri has got a really low, powerful. He said in his interview, I loved it. He said, you know, I know that I'm small, but I believe that um, uh, efficiency beats power. I think that's a Conor McGregor quote. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's but insane. he, uh, I love that. I love that uh, the confidence in, in his interview with, you know, his abilities and the way he reads the water, the way he uses, the, you know, there's a, a strength to weight ratio in paddling that's super important, right? So you have all different body types for the men and the women. Some are tall and thin, some are short and muscular, um, but it's, it's, it's the strength to weight ratio combined with the way you're able to read the water and really power your craft across it. I loved what you said about his um, fishing knowledge, helping out his surfing, which mm -hmm. And the more time you spend on the ocean, it doesn't matter what sport you're in, you're just going to be that much more connected. And you can tell the people who have more more uh, experience are the ones who can see waves that others can't. And um, I'm sure you've had that in uh, in a lot of your heats where you, you've got longboard experience, you've got all of types of regular surfing without the paddle mm -hmm. experience compared to a lot of these people who might only be paddle surfers. Yeah, I mean, every way that you can enjoy the ocean is only going to benefit each discipline that you choose. I found that when I started prone paddling more, it helped my downwinding for SUP because you're laying on the board, you can really feel what the bump is doing and you understand what the board is doing because your body, your legs will start to elevate if you're laying down and it helps you understand like, okay, I'm low to the water, I can feel this energy. Then when I'd get back on my stand-up paddle board, it helped me understand conceptually like, oh, how to slot my board in the trough of those waves to move along Ocean. Yeah, I have another thing because I was watching your Instagram while you were training in the off season and you were doing the cross steps to show how to get back to the tail into mm -hmm. the turn and the buoys. Cross stepping is a longboarding maneuver and someone who's not familiar with that usually doesn't have that balance from one foot to the other. And so I think that would be definitely an advantage when you're coming towards those buoys. You need to get to the back of the board and let the front half out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my longboarding background has really helped my footwork on the stand up race board. And it's actually my favorite thing to teach is footwork because so many paddlers, they'll learn how to paddle, they'll be on a board forever, but they're cemented to the board, right? And so I love to help people to move their feet because when you can move around on your board, you gain confidence and, and a little more freedom and then your, your turns improve too. And that's something that I've noticed. So my background is all in longboarding okay. and clean footwork makes everything else easier. The cleaner your footwork is and, and avoiding shuffling at all possible costs means that you're fast in transitions, your board's able to stay in a nice trim line, 
and everything works out better. And I've noticed that in this week is that those paddlers, specifically during that technical race, that were lighter on their feet and able to transition quick without actually sliding their feet across the, the surface of the deck were faster in those transition moments. They were able to get that maybe paddle dug in a little bit better. So it's really interesting that you're, you've been bringing that specifically in from a longboarding side into the footwork now to maybe be something that can start pioneering a little bit of a different approach in stand-up paddling. Yeah, it's super important to be able to move around and be agile and even, you know, just your approach on a buoy turn. Sometimes you will shuffle um, because when you're paddling hard, your legs are so hammered into your oh, board, yeah. right? So sometimes you'll shuffle a little bit. And you'll take maybe one little step, keep paddling because you want the board planing on the surface of the water. Then you'll take another little step. The goal is to be ready to make your turn by the time you get to the buoy. And instead of having to take all your steps sometimes right at the buoy. Because like I said, you're, you're using your legs and if you take all your steps at once, then it can suck all this energy out of your body. And we have uh, Shrimpy here, he's making a move. Oh, he's getting, he's getting a little overheated. You can tell he's really uh, making a move on T2, but then now he's crouching down on his board to get wet. It's hot out there. And Boothy, you can see a little bit of uh, increase in his cadence there. He sees that Shrimpy might be getting a little bit fatigued in the heat, and that's when you want to make a move, right? When you're in the back and you see your opponents slowing down, I mean, ideally you're kind of, you know, you're reading the water, but you want to read their body language at the same time. And you can learn a lot about even if you're in a draft pack or just what's going on in front of you by reading their body language. And so when you see somebody they seem to fatigue, it kind of can encourage you to like, oh, I'm going to push a little harder, put the pressure on them a little bit. Right. You can see that they're starting to slip for a moment and it gives you that extra boost of energy yourself, even like m maybe more mentally, Yeah. but then to push yourself physically to try and catch up to them. And that's exactly what's happening here with Michael Booth getting pretty close to Shrimpy from what we saw before. Yeah, definitely. On the back, right directly in from where they're at right now, they're passing by the old cemetery, which is called the... Um, I'm sorry, the Cementerio Santa Maria de Pazis. And they said there's about about an estimated thousand graves there. And they said when that was constructed, um, the Spanish government viewed death as a mystery. And so they were very fearful of death. And that's why they put them there to help the transition from death to the over the the next uh, the next stage or whatever the way they viewed it. And so that's why they picked that position directly heading out into the ocean. But here we go. We're getting a little bit closer. It looks like Michael Booth starting to gain a little bit. You can see how much this swell has picked up from the women's race this morning. We didn't have sets really, I think, this big starting to roll through. That wind's definitely pushing a little bit more. And it's kind of crazy to see how much is coming up to the side as Shrimpy's now starting to move into the lead. Yeah, and it's going to be a pretty technical part of the course because you have swell. And then you also have reverberation from the, from the island itself. So there can sometimes be a little bit of backwash, so you can have it coming from both directions. So um, being super agile on the board is really important. Util utilizing bracing if you need to, which is where you put the top side of the blade down on the water to help you kind of skim across so that you don't fall. But these, uh, these dugout type boards do add a little bit of extra stability. So, and here's our, here's our prone race right here. These guys are actually, our stand-up guys are passing some of our prone paddlers a little farther back in the pack typically stand-up paddle boards are faster they're longer they're two feet longer of course but then you also have the size of the blade which is bigger than the size of your arms significantly right? bigger yeah so um it's it's no surprise that our stand-up paddlers would be passing the traditional paddle boarders however if there was a, a course with a really strong headwind then sometimes the traditional paddle boarders uh, will fare a little bit better because they're lower to the water. Right, because they don't have that wind blowing against them and their body acts like a sail for right now. It's working in the favor of the stand-up paddlers with that little bit of wind from behind. That's true. I have an interesting question, Candace. Do you remember in the 90s, they had webbed gloves for surfing? <laughs> yeah. And they had the, the famous ones with the ape gloves, was the aquatic propulsion equipment. And um, those things used to make your arms burn so much because it would turn the surface of your hand into about three times the surface and your shoulders would die. Are they allowed in paddle surfing? No, in paddle boarding, that would not be allowed. Um, and I just, I don't think anybody would really try and do that. 
I mean, even in, in regular surfing, just paddling out, you'd get twice as tired, twice yeah. as fast. So here they are hugging that little rock section, and that is the 500-year-old castle. This was the biggest protection for the island as well as the Americas in the Second World War, and, now, and later the protection for the Americas for any of the ships coming across the Atlantic and from the Caribbean. And so this is a very historical spot. I'd say it's very much a power spot here on the island. And it was known as the, uh, the biggest engineering marvel since the island was colonized. Incredible. It's been here since the 16th century. And it's a beautiful, it's been a beautiful place to spend our time this week as well for the ISA World Sup and Paddleboard Championships. Because, you know, all of the disciplines have been running over about a 10-day window, and you've got some athletes that are here just competing in one or in two of the disciplines like yourself, Candice, it's given everyone a little bit of time to be able to experience what San Juan has around, to be able to see this beautiful San Juan Island with the, you know, old uh, town, as well as check out the castles. And it's really just been an incredible location. I think for a lot of the crew that haven't been able to travel as much over the last couple of years, um, kind of an easy entrance as we get a beautiful view here. And we can see so many of the paddlers now starting to round that headland. Yeah, yeah, the castle is phenomenal. I actually went for a run there this morning from our event site where we're at right now. So from the event site to the castle, around the castle and back is about four and a quarter miles. Um, and it was so cool. You can see the ocean and you're running by a castle and then I ran into a huge iguana the other day on whoa. my way back. And I was like, whoa. I think it was like a dinosaur. But um, this is a, such a beautiful place. The people here are incredible. The, whole, the local staff on the ground has been just phenomenal at this event. Um, I've been to several ISAs, and, and this one is, you know, the, the local crew has just been top-notch. So it's, it's really great. I think all the athletes are super appreciative of uh, what's going on here at this venue. So, Shannon, remember in the morning when we were having the women going around that side right there, and we were saying how much that little stretch can just give you a little boost with that, sh that swell coming in. It almost seems like with the wind and the changes of tides, that swell is getting a little more sheltered from that corner. It looks like it might be kind of in an east-northeast direction. So, basically, as soon as they start to turn that corner, it's too sheltered to help them out anymore, and you see the water just goes flat right, right where you see in the middle of our screen right there. That's right. You can still see some of those ripples, though, coming in on the kind of inside section of the headland there. And there's our front pack of the SEPs. That's what I was going to be interested in to see that uh, there's going to be a, a, a pack forming, so ideally, between the France three. France indeed. And Hunter was first. It looks like he might have moved to second. For our prone paddlers. Yes, exactly. But our, I got a glimpse of our, our top three stand-ups, and it was T2 Shrimpy. There they are. And Michael Booth, you can see that T2 in the front, and Shakuri in second, and then uh, Michael in the third position. They all have very different paddling styles, so it's easy for me to be able to spot them from far away. Yeah, um, that's amazing. I, well I, I'm a student of the game, so I'm I'm I I love the sport. I'm also a fan, so and I I coach, so technique is something that I pay close attention to. So. Um, three different different styles of, of paddling. You have T2, he's got this kind of long, smooth, efficient stroke. Uh, Shrimpy has a, a wider grip on his paddle and it's a lower paddle, right? It's a shorter paddle. So a wider grip is gonna give you more leverage, which is more power, right? So for someone like him who is smaller, he's gonna utilize as much power that, as he can. And he's young and agile, so he's able to get really low in his strokes. And then Michael is kind of, you know, he's very strong, right? So when you watch him as he puts his blade in the water, he like just power hammers his strokes, right? So he can, he like, he's kind of just like stab in the water, right? He's kind of a, a really strong guy. So it's, it's three different styles, but something that you pay attention to that's gonna be similar for all of them is you have, you know, four typical phases of the stroke. So when you're looking at a good stroke, you first look at the catch phase. That's where they're planting the paddle in the water, right? We're not pulling water. You're actually planting your paddle in the water and you're moving up and through the paddle. So ideally in a good stroke, you want to plant your blade entirely in the water before you start pulling back and you want to have a splash free stroke. So all of these guys have a pretty smooth catch phase 
where they're burying the paddle in the water. In a sprint race, you'll see a lot more splashing because it happens so quick and so powerful. But all three of these guys have a really smooth catch phase. Ideally, you want your shaft of your paddle straight up and down as it's entering the water. That's going to help you to go straight. And what you'll notice, um, then you have the power phase, which is that like meat and potatoes of the stroke. And all three of these guys have a really strong triangle that they make with their arms. Something you call a power triangle. Right now we're back to our top two of our... Um, oh, they're, they're off the screen now, but... Um, I think we have Erie here from Brazil. He's a Brazilian paddler on the flying fish board there. He's got a really, all these guys have great strokes, right? So you have your catch phase. Second phase is your power phase. That's where you're like pushing down hard, pulling back fast, having a nice wide grip on the paddle. And then the third is the exit phase. You want to exit by your feet, ideally. And then the fourth phase is the recovery. So they're going to come from their feet straight back to the catch phase again trying to keep all those strokes as efficient as possible. Right now, it looks like we have our second group of prone paddlers. I think that this is maybe third, fourth, and fifth. Yeah, it looks like it, Candice. And it looks like uh, Spain's in that group, too. We've got France and USA in that first group. Uh, we've got a group of five in the... Beautiful shot from the drones from uh, Action Sports Productions. The ASP group here filming it live. They also were in charge of filming the uh, portions of the Olympics in Tokyo in 2021. And, and in fact, I think I think that's Jay Johnson's uh, apartment right there on the castle. No, that's actually going to be my guest house. I'll um, I'll be taking that thing over in the next couple of days. One thing I wanted to mention as we we're talking about sh uh, Shrimpy, and we were talking about the youth and the power. Look at him. He's getting three strokes to everyone else's one stroke. Um, you're talking about that energy, the extra energy of being youthful. His cadence seems about three times as fast as the other guys. And um, Yeah, so what he may be, I, I don't want to say lax in power, but he's smaller, right? So those guys can, they're taller. They can get in a, a more of a glide per stroke. They can reach out a little bit farther. And so what one of them may get in glide per long stroke he's making up for and taking more strokes so three different styles of paddling i was talking before about that power phase right the power phase is where the, really you're pushing down pulling back you can see all three of these paddlers make a nice strong triangle with their arms mm -hmm. and then ideally you're exiting right near your feet or just behind your feet so if your paddle comes far past your feet and shrimpy does a really good job of his exit is like supreme it's right, right at, at his feet, feet right yes. so when your paddle goes too far past your feet it starts to act like a rudder just like in a canoe right you have a steersman that sticks the blade in the water to steer the canoe if your paddle goes too far past your feet then it's going to make you go crooked essentially so all of these guys have beautiful great efficient strokes and then that recovery phase where you're going from your exit back to your next catch now you can see um, T2 does have a bit of a outrigger canoe background. So his recovery phase comes a little bit around in a s little bit of a circle, just a little bit off to the side. And that's something that you're gonna see from some of the outrigger paddlers because of the way that they exit and recover into their next stroke. When you look at Shrimpy, his is a little bit more straight, which the straighter your recovery phase, that's the quicker you're going to be to your next stroke, right? The closest distance between two points is a straight line. So it's we're seeing Michael Booth make a move right here, Candace. He's on the right-hand side. He's just past Shrimpy. So I think Boothy has planned, you know, to, to stay with the leaders, and he's going to make a mark to make his move right now. Yeah, he, he may be making a move or... They may be switching, you know, switching leads and taking turns. There may be a little bit of communication there. It looks like somebody's broken off, and there's a little bit of a board gap, but I think that's still Tituan. I could be wrong. But, yeah, uh, right now we're getting an update from AV. We can tell you that, um, well, in fact, let's go down to Drew. And, and we're coming to you boat. live from the boat right now. Great cross shot going towards the other side. Now, last time we saw him kind of work the south side of the channel, the men are really hugging, hugging the north side of the channel. So a little different strategy in this heat. 
Now, if you've been following along, you've seen Shrippy Akari really splashing a lot of water on himself. And if you look at his paddle cadence, it's about twice that of what Tito Ampuyo out in front right now, and especially Michael Booth currently sitting in the third position is. So Shuri utilizing a lot of wasted energy here as he really increases his paddle cadence, trying to keep up with the Frenchman. Tito Juan, though, very confident and very poised and just consistent with his paddle stroke coming in into the channel. But the thing to talk about is Michael Booth from Australia. If you look at his, his cadence, it's about two thirds of what the rest of the group is doing. So you could tell he's use a lot, utilizing a, a lot of rest and sort of letting Shuri pull him along in this draft train. Now he seems to fall off here a bit, a bit as we see these cross waves kind of push through, but look for Booth to really start pushing it in the channel. Thanks so much, Drew. We're getting updates here. We so let's go, we got um, T2 in front, Trippy in second, Boothy in, four, uh, in third. We got Noik in fourth. We have our Brazilian, Ari Torino, he's in fifth. The two Italians are working together. That's Davi Alpino and Ricardo Rossi. They're sixth and seventh right now. And we can tell you that Christian Anderson from Denmark is in eighth. And bring this up. Number 20, Fernando Perez from Spain. He is in ninth. And number 166, Aaron Sanchez from Spain. So the Spaniards are ninth and tenth, and they're working together. So now we're round and around. Remember how flat the water was in the morning with no wind? We didn't have that movement of tide. It was still kind of on that, that cusp of the dropping tide and the, the rising tide. And there's a lot more action inside this, uh, inside this harbor now. And that's definitely wearing on them a little bit more, whereas I think the women's uh, round had a little bit more time to kind of draft behind each other and kind of save some energy through this zone. Yeah, this was this was the flat water section, um, but it's no longer the flat water section. It's going to be interesting to see what happens when these guys get back in the open water. Um, I'm seeing Shrimpy still with a lot of energy. That's you know he is he's a high cadence paddler, but that's and, his style. and that's his that's style, and he he's paddles. very efficient. If you look at the way that his strokes are, he has a perfect power triangle. He has a perfect entry and exit. He's not wasting any energy. His stroke is very efficient. He just has a lot of energy. Um, yeah. yeah. One thing I wanted to say is as we were talking about the cross stepping and how the board moves and. Keeping the board stable, I noticed in the tech race that um, Shuti, his lower body just stays almost locked, it seems like, and his upper body is doing most of the most of the movement. And you can see his, his board bobs very, very little with his strokes. Yeah, so that's a great observation when you say that his lower body looks locked because his knees are bent when he's paddling, but they're strong and stiff, kind of hammered into the board which you don't want to be bouncing up and down off your legs. You want your legs engaged. You want your knees bent, using them kind of in a bit like of a deadlift position. Um, and you want them to be locked so that everything your upper body does gets driven through your legs and into your board, and it moves your board steadily along the surface of the water. Definitely. If you bounce in your legs, then your board is going to bounce. That's what I try to tell people when they learn to surf, because so many of the surf instructors talk about the pop-up, but some people jump to the board, and it bobs, displaces a bunch of water, and kills the speed of the board. And I always tell people, hey, think about the board, keeping the board as smooth as you can, and don't worry about what your body is doing. You're controlling the board. The smoother you keep it, the easier it's going to stay with the wave, especially in a tiny wave when you're, you're teaching someone to surf. And as a shaper, I know that the more movement in the board, the more that you're displacing, you're starting to push water in front of the board instead of gliding. Yeah, you want the board to be planing on the surface of the water as smoothly as possible. So we got an update with uh, Ricardo Avila from Puerto Rico. He's in 16th, so we're trying to track all of our paddlers as they go through the course. We are 56 minutes into the men's prone division and 48 minutes in the men's stand-up division. And these guys, the top three, Tijuan, Michael Booth, Shrimpy, they are just powering through this course. And it's been T2 leading out in front. And he's, and he's a former champion in the distance race, winning in Nicaragua in the very hot, humid conditions in 2014. In 2019, he won the technical in El Salvador. And right now, it looks like Boothie has come off that pack. 
Um, Shrimpy's making a little bit of a move on the inside of Tituan. I'm not sure if you guys can help me where they are exactly on the course, if there's another transition back into the ocean coming up soon, but there is definitely a separation in the pack. We're and still about three quarters of the way. Would you say that, Bo? Yeah. The, their time is 49 minutes. Yeah. They're about three quarters of the way through. They're going to be heading back to the original start line. They're going to be paddling in that lagoon again, under the bridges, and then heading back out to the ocean. All right. So we still have plenty of time in essentially this flat water section. So uh, I don't think anybody's really going to go out on their own just yet. It'd be a little bit too soon to do that for this front pack. They're going to do their best to stick together. Here we go. We have... Our leaders in the traditional paddleboard division, and I'm sure these guys, Hunter's playing this smart. He led a lot in the open ocean. So there's Julian in front with the prone and Hunter Fluger, and let's go down to the boat and check in with Drew Marin. Uh, coming to you live from the boat once again. We're catching up with our prone paddleboarders. Not much in the way of any changes in the leaderboard. One, two, you're looking at them right now, just out in front. It's Julian, Marta Carreña from France, but he's just on his fin box is Hunter Fluger from Team USA. And you see Hunter's, Hunter's cadence, just about a third or two thirds of what the Frenchman is. He's just sort of holding on to that energy, riding that sort of uh, dr draft from the Frenchman out in front. You can see him really start to back off because he starts to accelerate, almost pushing up on the back end of his board. So we'll see Fluger, once they get into this flat water section through this channel, he will start to break out and try to move around the Frenchman. But the Frenchman's looking very, very strong. Julian's paddled a very flawless race thus far. And just on the outside of him is that's the third portion of the stand-up paddlers all sort of bunched up. That is fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, as you can see in a big, long draft train. So some jostling for position also going on there. That's your live shot from the boat. We'll catch you at the finish line. Back to you guys. Thanks so much, Drew. You know, we, we, we've been talking about Hunter winning the last two ISA Worlds in China in 2018 and in El Salvador in 2019. But Julian was a copper medal winner in El Salvador. So he's stepped up his game. He knew Hunter was going to be. So he's kind of Hunter's little rival here. And he's making a statement like, you know, I'm out in front of you. I know you're the two-time defending gold medal champion. But it looks like Julian's put his A game out here today. Yeah, and and I'd say that, you know, their Hunter's playing this race smart. They both are because you don't want to lead the entire race. It looks like there's a little communication right there, too. He just kind of turned around, Julian did, and I'm sure they're they're talking it out. As You know, as sportsmen, you, you, it behooves both of them to take turns, right? Um, you're, you're faster working together than you are just pulling the whole race by yourself, right? I have a question, Candice. So we, we, as we look at first and second, we've got the bark board. What's the purple and white one? Are you familiar with that type I'm of board? I'm not actually familiar with that brand, no, but it does look like it's got a little bit more of like the square tail design. What I'm noticing as a shaper is the side walls are very, very straight and vertical as opposed to the bark, which is a really rolled kind of a kayak-like board. As you said, the... The bark is one of the fastest boards, but is it also instable compared to having a flatter bottom? Um, yes, a flatter bottom board is definitely going to be more stable. Um, the pintail with the rounded bottom is going to be faster, right? In certain conditions, speed and stability are synonymous. Here. But um, So here's our map, the angle. So they're passing in, they're, they're in that channel. So when we see the big boat, we're going to... You see where the big boat is docked in? That's the, the paddlers are coming up to that big boat. So they got to go under the bridge, back into the lagoon, one lap around the lagoon, underneath the bridges, out to a left-hand buoy turn, and then go to Fiji Rock where there's no buoy out there. Uh, AV led it up to the competitors. If you want to go wide and catch a wave, you want to cut short on the reef, it's totally up to you. And earlier this morning, we had the women competing out here, both in the same divisions of prone and SUP. And Eureka from Japan takes the gold medal. Spain with the with Judette with the silver medal. Italy with the uh, bronze medal, and Liz Hunter from Team USA with the copper medal. 
And here's the men. Duna. Excuse me, the women in their SUP, Duna and uh, Esperanza, were working one and two, and it came down to the final wave from uh, Fiji Rock and the sprint up the beach. Melanie from France takes the uh, copper, excuse me, the bronze medal, and Lena Agaitis in fourth from Canada, the copper medal. Yeah, this, this really kind of helps us see where everyone is. As soon as, uh, just as Bo was mentioning, we had that big ferry that they passed by earlier. Yeah. That's kind of a good marker for everyone to know where we're at. And that was in the center left of the screen of that map. So we can get a little bit of an idea where they're at if you look at this layout of the course. And look at these. We've got little broken up packs all over the place. And it's amazing to see how the different lines that everyone chooses. Yeah, Ken, it looks like five guys on stand-up have been in that second group, maybe four. Yeah, it looks like there's actually, so you've got your top three in the lower left of the screen. Then you got fourth and fifth with a few board distance between the two of them. And then that's going to be sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, I believe. There's four paddlers in that group. Kind of hard to see from here, but maybe even five. So that might be sixth through tenth in that third pack. So we and know in that the, second pack, that's Noik. Uh, he's in fourth place. Fifth place is from uh, Brazil. That's Ari Torino. And then coming up in that pack is probably the two Italian, Ricardo and Davi. And Polar Bear should be in that group, too, from Denmark. Yeah, there's a pack of five guys there. 9-10 are our Spaniards, Aaron and Fernando. So they're trying to work together. They're trying to keep it close. As we are and approaching the ferry boat. Go ahead, Candice. T2 has been pulling the train this entire time. Um, in this whole back stretch, which is pretty interesting. There hasn't been any changes. So um, there's going to be a little bit of strategy there maybe. Uh, you know, I'd say Michael and Shrimpy are, are working hard to stay with him. Um, I, I would have thought that there would be some a bit of a change at this point that T2 would maybe say, hmm, okay, guys, your turn to pull. But – it's also sometimes beneficial to be in that front position when you get back into the open water because if you get the first bump and you can separate yourself from the pack and then you get another bump and another bump and another bump and you just go for it, right? He might just be like, hey, I'm confident in my fitness. I, I'm going to pull the train and then I'm going to make sure that I'm in the front when we get back into the open water so that I can get that first glide. Well, t is pulling a, a page out of, out of your performance. You like to lead. <laughs> The race. I do. <laughs> it's fun to lead. <laughs> but um, but position, sometimes Candace, sometimes in a distance race it can, um, you know, if your competitors are drafting off of you and conserving a little bit of energy, then they might have a little more in the tank to pass you at the end. That's happened to me several times in racing, um, not because I wanted it to happen, maybe because the people behind me didn't want to take a turn or some people won't offer the, they that that's their strategy right they'll sit in the fourth or fifth position save a little bit of energy so they can pass you at the end right um that's not always the case sometimes there's races where i've pulled the pulled the train and said no i don't want to switch because i want to be in that front position so um that may be the case of what's happening now but regardless all three of these guys are really strong open ocean paddlers and even a week there's a there's quite a big gap, but he's so talented in the downwind that, you know, he is within striking distance, I'd say. We're seeing pretty much half the field and the men stand up distance right in this one shot. We have 32 paddlers and, um, you know, everyone's having a good race today. Yeah, it looks like on the right side of the screen, I can see some of our uh, paddlers from the U.S. It looks like maybe that is Riley Jaggy. And then Bodie, Bodie there? Von Allman right behind him. I'm not sure who the third person is. I'm looking at the right side of the screen. Well, that's great. The two young teenage uh, paddlers here for Team USA working together. Yeah, it's awesome. And then you have this middle pack here that's right in the middle of the screen. Really hard to decipher who's who because they're got quite a few starboards and everybody in the same colored jerseys. Once we get a little bit closer, I might be able to tell you who's who. So speaking of teamwork, when we did the interview with Duna, she said they really went into that with the plan of making um, 
doing teamwork, saving, conserving each other's energy, having good communication of who wants to lead for a little bit, switching places, recharging, and mostly, basically trying to kind of even out their energy through the finish. Yeah, I mean, if you work together and you plan your changes, then you're going to be faster than everybody. You're faster working together and conserving energy. Now, this, is, this shot's great because you can really see how far apart those packs are. So I would say that the top three are pretty set, barring any kind of uh, weird wipeouts. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty good gap, unless somebody falls off the train and bonks. That's, but uh, if I was a betting person, I would, I would say you got your, your gold, silver, and bronze within that, that top mix there of the three. And that second pack between fourth and fifth, between uh, Noeek and Ari, you know, they're fighting for that copper medal. Yeah. So there's races within the races. So time right now, we just hit the one hour mark for the men stand up and 108 roughly for the prone paddlers. So we're about maybe 20, 25 minutes away from the finish. Exciting stuff. I wonder if uh, Shrimpy can get another gold medal here or is it gonna be T2? Is it gonna be Michael? Or somebody from the back going to make a move. And it looks like there's some, there was some moving and a shaking going on in that third pack. Yeah, someone's trying to break away because they know they're getting closer to the lagoon where they started. They'll have to do one full lap in the lagoon. And then they'll be heading underneath the bridges out to the north side into the Atlantic Ocean. And then they'll be passing on a left-hand turn outside the break of the surf break. They'll be paddling parallel to the beach past Fiji Rock, make a left-hand turn, hopefully catch a wave, and then we'll have our finish on the beach. Bo, I was going to say, if they can possibly pull up that map again, now that we're just going right next to that ferry, we can give much more of an accurate, um, an accurate showing of where exactly they are located on the course. Especially that pack of five right now. So you see where that, that boat is docked? That's where the pack of five is. And they're heading left to right, going towards underneath the bridge. The yellow marker is in. Then they'll do another one lap around to the start area, back underneath another series of bridges, and then out to the orange can outside the surf spot. They'll make a left-hand turn, paddle towards Fiji Rock, and then left-hand turn to the finish line. So that lagoon where they do make that second lap around from where the start was, that's a mix of fresh water and salt water. Um, there's a lot of rain, as we've seen here. And so um, a lot of people use that as their little morning jog around there. And they've actually, um, they've done a lot of work to make sure that that water is clean and uh, people can enjoy swimming in there as well. And so a lot of work on the ecotourism side here. And um, we're starting to see exactly where they are starting to work their way in. This is the other airport too. And I heard that you can take flights right into JFK, Miami, all sort of places right from here. Well, this is kind of like the private planes and the small plane airport. This is not the, the hustle and bustle of the international airport in San Juan. That's why we're, that's where my 1933 Cessna is, is parked. We're working on it right now. I'm going to use that to get home. Just joking. Well, one hour into the race, 103 counting through. And for the prone paddlers, they're into 111 and counting. You see the mix of uh, SUP and prone. Yeah, you can see one and two. You have uh, Hunter and... That's Julian from France. And this is a pretty, this is a great battle because the overall team points are, are getting a little bit mixed up. It's getting pretty hot between the United States and the French. The Spanish are going to be racking up some points as well from that the women's finish there at the, the sub-distance race. So every single position counts for points towards that overall. So today there's gonna be a lot of points gained and some big implications for that overall. And Team Japan with two gold medals, a silver medal also yesterday in the sub-surf. So in our prone Men's distance, 18K. Julian from France is in the lead, followed by Hunter Fluger from Team USA. In third, Andrew Newton from Team New Zealand. 
and also another Andrew Bayat uh, from Great Britain. He's in fourth place. And David Buell from Spain. He was in that league group, but he's had some hard times here. He's down to fifth. All right. Here's our leaders, T2 in front, Shrimpy in second, and Michael Booth in third. You can see the water moving in the front of the screen on the right side. There's a little bit of a current there. You can see the difference in the surface texture on the water, too. T2 taking a little break. He just put something in his mouth. He's having a little snack. Yeah, he's probably <laughs> hydrating. It looks like there maybe might be a little switch here in the pack. T2's kind of off to the side. Maybe he's saying, hey, I'm going to take a rest. We might see a little change here. And then there's going to be those two buoy turns in the corner of the lagoon, which will be interesting to see if anybody tries to make a move here. And we got Boothy kind of going in the middle here. So there's a little jockeying for positioning going on right now. Still a ways to go in this race. So, yeah, you got T2 on. Looks like he's paddling with an 85 T2, and I think that, oh, it's hard to see. I was checking out the, the their blades. I use a quick blade as well, so I can usually uh, look and see. Uh, I think that Shrimpy might be using an 82 UV blade, which both have different um, power, phase, power surfaces, so the underside of the blade has a different shape. Some of the paddles have what's called a dihedral down the back side of the blade. And then others have like more of a scoop. So we got a little side drafting. So this is, Shrimpy is d utilizing the side draft off of T2. And Michael's gonna work, he's gonna really try to stay right in there um, with T2 and probably not allow Shrimpy to get back on the tail. If that's, that's a little bit of the jockeying for position happening right there. But the side draft is also very effective. Like so I they said, seem like they're pretty much cruising right now. No one's going to make a break. If you were in this pack of three, when would you make your break to have separation? In the open ocean. In the open ocean. Yeah. So if I was in a pack like this with three people, I would try to take over as far as the communication and call changes, maybe every three to four minutes. This is our fourth and fifth place paddler. Yeah, it's Noeek. Noeek and Erie. This is a really great showing for Erie to be up here. Um, you know, Pat, looks like there's a little communication going on. If they were smart too, they would be working together, changing every few minutes. Because they're they would be faster. You're faster if one person uses full energy, the other person rests for a little bit, and then you switch, right? Then the other person is full energy while the, others, while the other rests for a little bit. So like you, we were talking about before, you asked, when would I make a, make a move, right? Ideally, if you're working in a pack, you want to communicate and try to um, change every few minutes, maybe every three to four minutes, and communicate which side you're pulling off of the draft. That way, everybody's a little bit faster. But sometimes at you know, this level, uh, they don't want to communicate. They want to let the person in front do as much of the work as possible, right? So when you saw T2, he took a some sort of, uh, I don't know, some sort of an energy supplement. Maybe it was a goo or a salt tab or what. I'm not sure what he had, but he's probably feeling it. And if you're in the front and everyone's drafting you, you have the power to slow the pace down as well, right? So right now we're looking at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And this pack is working together. Yeah, that third pack has been sticking together for quite a long time now. They're coming past all these nice, fancy yachts. And we've got some more paddlers coming up from behind. Yeah, in this group, Ricardo and Davi from uh, Italy. We can tell you Christian Anderson also in this group. I don't see, yeah, Christian's in the back. And also possibly the two Spanish uh, paddlers in Aaron and Fernando. Uh, the NSP 40. Oh, that's Fernando Perez. Yeah, 20. Fernando. And we have our third pack with Bodie. We got Bodie von Almond there on the SIC. 
little side drafting going on right next to him. Bodie's only 16 years old. He's been on a tear this last summer and last year during our winter series, just having some great performances. Oh, that's Itzel Delgado from Peru, just on the on the back end of Bodie. Right on the right side of Bodie. He's yep. on the purple infinity. Um, Itzel is on a blackfish dugout today. He's been doing great all year long. He won the U.S. Open of SUP. Well, these the two were one and two in the distance race from Malibu to Santa Monica. They were. And how big of a race is the U.S. Open? Um, it's a pretty big race. It was the first stop on the AP World Tour this year. Uh, Michael Booth was there. You had Artur Rutkin from France. A lot of top paddlers came, and um, Danny Ching was there as well. So it was highly competitive. The course went from Malibu to the Santa Monica Pier, and it was really challenging. There was fog, so um, it was really important to make sure that you, know, you went to the race meeting so that you understood what was going on. It's up to you to navigate your own course, and Itzel and Bodhi did a really good job of that. Um, they went away from the other pack and because they felt like with the fog it, that they weren't really going the right direction and at one point Itzel stopped and looked down at his watch on the map on his GPS and he could tell that he wasn't going the correct direction wow. so they recharted their course and they ended up winning first and second place and some of the more veteran paddlers weren't weren't very happy about it <laughs> um, because there was a, a you know a situation with with the lead boat that came up, came along their draft pack and said, you know, they're like, hey, are we going the right direction? Uh, yeah, you're going the right direction. And then they, you know, sped off and had to be a safety boat at that time. And some of that pack decided to continue following the direction that the lead boat went. So there was, right. some, there was some discrepancy there with some of the athletes that weren't pleased with their result. But ultimately, in a race like that, it's your responsibility to you know, chart your own course. Um, the women, myself and April, were in a pack together and we didn't have any boat telling us anywhere to go. We just had to figure it out. So we, we ended up getting to the finish line <laughs> and um, we made it, made it may have gone a little bit farther into the fog than we had to, but pretty cool to see um, a move like that from Itzel to be able to have the confidence to say, you know what, I don't feel the ocean is moving the right direction and I'm gonna stop and take the chance and look at my GPS pull off of the lead pack of veteran paddlers and you know had to make a choice basically as as a waterman to you know set his own line and him and Bodie ended up going one and two in that distance rates because and, of that choice and Itzel was a silver medalist in El Salvador so he, he's had a couple of impressive results yeah Itzel has been working really really hard um, he trains with the SEPA Academy out of Hungary and that's uh, Daniel and Bruno Hasuyo's mother she is a excellent trainer and writes all his training programs and he is on it he just like sticks to the program he's doing his his running and his biking and his gym workouts and putting a lot of time on the water so really really proud of itself I'm a, I'm a fan <laughs> now what does the cross training look like for you as athletes competing specifically in the distance side of things uh distance it's time on the water right you, you have to put in a lot of time on the water and balancing that with strength workouts and extra cardiovascular workouts. And then, of course, eating right is super important. Yeah, health yeah. as far as food goes is so, so important. Yeah. And like you were saying, even at the beginning of this race, that each of these athletes coming up to compete in this over the last few days would have been putting, you know, specific hydration into their body as well as specific meals to prep themselves for the amount that they're going to be burning out here for this hour, hour and a half. Yeah, absolutely. Some athletes are drinking uh, kind of carbohydrate drinks a couple days before to add a little bit to the tank. Um, other athletes don't even do that. Maybe a big pasta dinner or something, a little bit extra protein. But the hydration for a, a, an event like this is the most important thing. You want to make sure that you're drinking plenty of water, but not just drinking water by itself. It needs to have electrolytes. If you drink too much water, you're going to flush all that good stuff out of your body, and that could, actually can make it worse. Yeah. Yeah, keeping those minerals, keeping those electrolytes in the system is so important. We can see now that that front pack is just starting to approach uh, that first buoy inside of the lagoon. And that's where you were saying we might start to see some of that fight, that little bit more aggressi aggressive paddles as they're approaching those buoys to try and take leading positions. Yeah, if you see this first buoy, it's not too sharp of a turn. So you can kind of 
really just low angle and curve around. Um, we can see where the, the next buoy is in relation to that buoy. Here we go, we got our first turn. And it looks like shrimpy on the turn. And to do a turn like that, these guys are pretty aggressive. Michael's, the Michael's really upping his up. cadence there, yeah. So, you know, on the, to do a turn that aggressively after paddling this far is, you know, these guys are, I mean, they're the best in the world, right? So having that agility and strength and endurance in your legs, Shrimpy is really increasing his cadence. He's such a powerful paddler um, for someone his size. It's really cool to see how efficiently he uses every single stroke. He doesn't waste anything. I'd say that he has a perfect stroke. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> of these three, who do you think has the best shot to win? Uh, well, I have my favorites, but uh, uh, it's really, you know, I mean, all three of these guys are exceptional paddlers. And really, it could be, it could be any one of them. It's just going to, uh, I don't, I don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you would make your I move say, in the open ocean. These guys are starting to make their move here in the lagoon. Oh, and looks like we have a little bit of a traffic jam. Oh, no. Right through some canoe, pa some kayakers. Wow. That would be very <laughs> unexpected for these guys in that mental side of, you know, they're on that straight zone here to the next buoy, and suddenly the kayakers are in the mix. Yeah. Also going, what is happening out there? They dealt with that really well. All right, we have one more buoy coming up here. And Shrimpy's leading the charge here. see T2 in second and Michael Booth in third. And look at the cadence Booth he's putting on. When he lays down the hammer, you better watch out. And, I mean, it looks to me like Shakuri is not afraid to push right now. He's, you know, he's doing everything he can to stay in that front position. Like I said, you want to be in that front position when you're getting out into the open water because when you catch a, bu catch a bump, and you connect another one and another one and another one. That's how you really spread out your spread out and make a gap. And look at the wake coming off these three going out in the lagoon. Yeah, this is uh, not a no wake zone when these guys are around. <laughs> and we can't even see that second pack in the view. So these three will determine the first three medals, gold, silver, and bronze. And there's the second pack. That is Noik and Ari. So they, so. Okay, they started in the lagoon. They went under the bridge. They went out to the open ocean. They made a left-hand buoy turn, went all the way down to the uh, far west end of San Juan. They came down into the harbor. They made another left-hand turn. They passed the boats, the piers. Now they're finishing up their lap in the lagoon. And next up, they'll be going underneath their second bridge to go out to the ocean. Yeah, this next leg is going to be really interesting to see. There's definitely some waves, too. So if they're able to stay near each other in that open ocean stretch and connect some bumps, the waves are probably most definitely going to play a factor in coming around Fiji Island. And it sounds like the prone paddlers are about five minutes behind where the stand-up paddlers are for those race leaders. So that's the division that we're starting to see formed. It's an 18-kilometer race here around old San Juan and the entirety of San Juan Island, which has been incredible. And now we're coming up to that finish where just, I mean, really quickly here, we're going to see these guys hitting this open ocean stretch back into the wind again. And for those of you tuning in online, thanks so much for joining on isasurf.org. Be sure to check out Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube at ISA Surfing. And for any photos you're taking around the contest site maybe this week, hashtag ISA Surfing. And it'll be exciting to see these paddlers coming across the finish line. Okay. That, that stretch right around Fiji Island is super technical. I got a chance to paddle out there today on a, on a prone paddle board. And when you catch a wave, there's great rave waves running right to the finish, but there's also a little side wave that comes off of that inside reef that makes it really easy to wipe out or fall. So at the end of this race, these guys have not only a wave to catch, but also a side wave. Oh, we have another uh, paddler on the course. Looks like he's just cruising here. So that when I was talking about you know the uh, stroke efficiency earlier today, 
we were to analyze this guy's stroke, uh, you could see that his, you know, he's not really getting that blade all the way in the water. <laughs> yeah, there's still a little top of the blade sticking out. Yeah, his out. grip is kind of narrow, right, which doesn't give him a whole lot of leverage. And it looks like the paddle's too big for him. Uh, it's a pretty big blade. I'd say that that's maybe, uh, you know, a rental, some rental equipment, but he's, you know, Polly doesn't even know that the fastest men in the world just passed him, which is a Literally. pretty cool thing about this sport that, you know, so many people can be on the water. It doesn't matter what level you're at. Stand-up paddling is just so incredible because it allows you to enjoy the ocean, enjoy any body of water. You can be a complete beginner, non-athletic person, or you can be one of the greatest watermen or waterwomen in the world and find something within the sport to um, even just enjoy or to challenge yourself. Well, we're hour 20 into the men's distance 18K race, an hour 28 for our men in the prone position. Uh, paddling in their race between Julian and Hunter, but the excitement is really going to start the feast right here with Shrimpy now taking the lead, T2 off to the left, and Michael Booth still in third place. And I can see that Shrimpy clearly wants to get in the open ocean first. He's confident in his ability in the open water. Um, it is a little dangerous, the fact that Michael Booth has been in that third position for so long because... That third position in the draft pack, you're saving the most energy. The farther back you are in the pack, the, the more energy you are saving. And, I mean, Michael Booth is a world champion. <laughs> he's an exceptional distance battler, and he's really strong. So um, he could just be playing it smart, trying to sit back. If I was to compare open ocean skills and bump riding, I would say that uh, Shrimpy and T2 have a little bit of an edge over, over Boothie. But, uh, again, all three of them exceptional paddlers in the open water and in the flat water. We're seeing Noeek and Airy right here in fourth and fifth. They're going to be battling for the copper medal. So there's another race within the race. And then the pack of five and six guys in the third pack. Yeah, Noeek just looked back over his shoulder. You can see that their cadence has slowed down a little bit compared to before. I think they were really trying to grind and catch up to that front pack. But at this point, they probably know, okay, we don't have enough time left on the course to really catch those top three positions. Um, you saw Noeek look over his shoulder to, just to make sure, okay, it's between us two. Now let's, uh, Erie's just bending down there to get a little bit wet. He's hurting um, with this heat. The heat is pretty brutal. But it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a, a battle between these two in the open water. Uh, if I had to, Bet on it, I'd say Nui gets a little bit of the edge. He's from New Caledonia. They get excellent downwind conditions down there, and he's a downwind specialist. So he'll be able to use any little bump on the ocean to, to help him. Yeah, this is going to be a really exciting finish to that race. You know, going for those positions for gold, silver, and bronze are going to be really tight for the finish. We could see it come down to two boats hitting the sand at the same time and who's off and running first. We could see some distance created if a bump comes through or like a proper stand-up wave because we've seen that swell increasing through the day. Yeah, and there's waves over there. And that little spot, they're coming in in a different location than where we came in from the technical race, right? So they're coming straight in from that Fiji rock, and there's that little wave there that, that goes pretty far, and you can connect bumps all the way to the finish. And here we go. we got Shrimpy making a move already. He's got about one and a half board lengths as he's heading out into the open water and he's young <laughs> that you know young a lot of extra human growth hormone at that age recovery is fast and he's certainly hungry um to get another gold medal i'd say and he's confident you know confidence plus momentum is a dangerous combination and for him, too, to have found that gold medal just a few days ago now gives him, he's had that actual taste of victory at this level. Now he wants to get it again. It's a different discipline, of course, a different type of race. But was it like that for you once you secured your first gold medal to then be even more hungry with more races that you entered because you felt that, that relief of actually taking away a win? Or did you feel like you had more hunger going into it to win the very first time? That's a great question. I think that was so long ago, so it's hard for me to, to remember. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to be said about momentum, right? And momentum does build confidence in, hey, I've done this before. I can do it again. 
but I also believe that confidence comes from preparation, not performance. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to all three of these men and even, you know, a shrimpy as well, that I, I know that he's come here prepared, right? So um, you can't always rest on a, a previous win, but a win this week, that's going to tell you, hey, wait a minute. Okay, I'm in top form against the best guys in the world. Yeah, I, I can do this. Yeah, I love that breakdown, that that preparation is what allows uh, confidence, especially when it comes to sport and the work that's being put in behind the scenes. And we can see them now approaching this first buoy. They pass the fort for the front pack bow, and Shrimpy's in the lead. Oh, my God. Look at the lead that he's got <laughs> on now. And I'm just trying to rack my brain. Candace. I don't think an individual has won the tech and the distance in the same ISA year. Um, I think so. I, I did in Mexico. Did you? I don't know about for the men. For the men. I know Jordan Mercer has in the prone. Yeah, in the prone. Um, maybe Australia has in the prone as well, but I'm not sure if it's ever happened for men's sup. So that'd be a great stat to check. Yeah, yeah. we're trying to and research that right now because we know Titu has won the distance and he's also won the tech, but they were different years. Mm -hmm. But right now, Shrimpy is putting the hammer down and Titu feeling the effect of of dragging the other two for pretty much 80% of the race. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have a choice to stay in front or to fall behind and get in a second or third place position. And so that's all part of the, the racing strategy and the tactics. And we still have a little bit of, you know, a little ways to go here, but I'm, I'm enjoying watching this. <laughs> And we could be seeing Team Japan walk away with two gold medals now in this specific, uh, in the distance racing, because we just saw the prone gold medalist go to Eureka Horibe, which was an incredible performance for a new mom as well with an 11-month-old baby. Got the mother-in-law here with her and her husband paddling in the races for Team Japan. So that was really exciting. And now to see if Shrimpy can cross the line in the distance race to add another medal. And they'll be looking very strong heading into finals day for those team medals as well. Yeah, yeah. they also picked up a, a, a silver yesterday in the women's final. So one hour, 26 minutes and counting. There's the second group right now because Shrimpy has broken away. Michael Booth has moved into second place. Tituan Puyo is now in third place. And there we can really see the distance that the SUP paddlers have over our prone paddlers. We can see the, the three packs. Of, well, actually, we'll have a, a fourth pack thrown in on the left-hand side of the screen here, I think, with our uh, fourth and fifth place paddlers. But we've got a lot of those SUP paddlers out in front ahead of the prone paddlers. So we'll probably be seeing maybe 10 of them finish ahead of those top two in the prone race. Now the wild card, Candace, and I know you're thinking about this, who's gonna catch a wave? Is it gonna be the back of the pack catching the front of these three, or is Shrimpy gonna catch a wave and run away with it? Yeah, I mean, that's why it's so important to get as far out as front as possible right now for him, because T2 and Michael are still pretty close. Hard to tell from some of these different angles, but um, if he comes around Fiji Rock and there are no waves and they get a wave, then it can change things up a bit. And now we see Hunter Fluger in the lead over Julian from France. Yulin. So Hunter, yeah, Yulin. Yulin from France. Yulin. But, um, and Hunter's going for a three-peat, three in a row. Yeah, and I know Hunter definitely is going to want to be in the first position uh, of the draft going out into the open ocean because he's really skilled downwind paddler. He lives on Oahu, and he does that Hawaii Kai run often, and he uh, he's just really, really great in the bump. And so, like I said before, you want to be in that front position leading into the open ocean. And we got some waves here, too. A little bit of side swell coming in. Well, we, got the, in, we got the incoming tide, too. So, so really like, go ahead. paying attention to your course is really important. Um, not being too far inside. Sometimes you think, oh, I can... A oh, little bit of bunny hopping going on. It's a little shallow, maybe. A little sandy sandbar pass right there. And typically, traditional paddleboarders don't wear leashes during races. It's, uh, it's a pretty uncommon thing. But because of safety, because they're on such a big course, it was a requirement. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so it can, you know, it can be kind of a 
a little bit of a challenge, you know, just managing your equipment because you go from your belly and then you paddle up on your knees, right? So the leash has to be small enough to where it's not going to drag in the water and slow you down, but also be comfortable when you're knee paddling. Right. So are they typically wearing an ankle leash as opposed to a knee leash? I would think so because once you're paddling on your knees and your knees are bent, it's kind of annoying right there. It's like trapped. Yeah, it gets right really tight. Knees. Yeah. But even having it on your ankle, I could understand why you would typically not want to be wearing a leash if you're on a paddleboard. Yeah, because when you're on your belly and it's on your ankle, it's probably going to drag in the water a little bit. So, Here's a pack of four. This will be third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. In the paddle distance race, sitting at one hour, 38 minutes now on the clock. Yeah, for our proners, they started eight minutes before, so their clock is at... Uh, one, 138. And here we go. We've got Shrimpy coming around the corner here at Fiji Rock. And he's and, all alone right he's, now. He's all alone. He's going to do everything he can to get any bump that he possibly can. He's looking over his shoulder. There's Michael Booth. There he's just go. entered the fray. Wow. <laughs> and now to see if he can finish for Shrimpy with a mistake-free race and it's, coming into the finish. Yep, and it's been a pretty, uh, pretty consistent out there, some of these waves coming through. Um, this is really exciting. I'm, I'm such a fan. <laughs> Sharia Rocky yeah. currently sitting in first, getting himself onto a good-looking bump and looking very solid to take away another gold medal <laughs> this week, Bo. A double-double wow. for Shrimpy. Candace did it in Sayuli to Mexico in 2015, and we're trying to rack our brain. I don't think uh, uh, any of the men have done a double-double. They've done double-doubles, but in different years but shrimpy at the age of 16 he's competing against the world's best former champions Tito has won this event and michael booth a two-time champion of the long distance but look who's got a wave on the outside Tito's on a wave i'm not sure if michael's on a wave out there too wave i'm not sure if michael's on a wave out there too because i think michael came around the corner first they could be on the wave together i'm not really sure but this is exciting i i'm a huge shrimpy fan and this is just such a cool thing to see. He's so, so disciplined and dedicated and humble. That of, of anybody I've seen this week, I mean, the Japanese team is just so incredibly humble and prepared coming here. And it's just so fun to see them be successful. And wow, I'm, I'm, I want to get out of the booth and go down there and give him a high five. <laughs> well, you get out of here. Thank okay. you so much for Thank calling you. with us, Candace. You made all the Bye. difference. And uh, we'll chat to you soon. As we see, Trimpy Shuri Araki of Japan jogs across the finish line as your 2022 gold medalist for the SUP distance racing. And coming in strong behind him is Tito to finish off in second for Team France with a silver medal. Tito Puyo and Michael Booth of Australia with the bronze medal behind. What an incredible finish to that race. Tito holding the pack in the front of the pack for so long, carrying them. And Trimpy, Shuri, Araki finding that breakaway moment as they came through the finish and entered into open water again. And, and you he know was what is untouchable by that. And stage. you know what his, pa uh, his hat says? Keep paddling. And what did he do? He kept paddling. And there's his dad right there putting the uh, flag around him. It looks like Aries now coming in for that battle. He's trying to chase uh, Noeek right now. Noeek's in fourth place. So France will have two on the podium with second going to T2 and fourth going to Noeek. Unless Eric can catch this wave and he's got it. So we could have a sprint for the copper medal right here because Aries comfortably on this wave. And if this wave holds up, he can catch Noeek. Surfing in. Noeek's found a little bump on the inside, so that helps out. But Aries got this bigger bump, and Noeek's got about maybe five board lengths ahead. And now that bump just kind of runs away, so they do not merge up. This is for the last medal for the men's podium. Looks like Noeek is, Noeek is on the home stretch to cross that. Finish line with a medal and to add a second to Team France. A great paddle from Ari as well for Team Brazil. 
But it's Noeek finding another bump through here to the inside to just give him that extra acceleration as he approaches the sand, checks behind him, and now hits cruise mode, knowing that he's going to be a medalist. And our copper medalist with the French flag behind him for Noeek Dariyu. And an incredible finish as we see Ari looking to cross the finish line, though. Yeah, in fifth place. And he had a great battle with uh, Noeek. You know, they tried to make a pass to catch the lead group. Candace was talking about it, and all of a sudden, it was, you know, not to be. He doesn't need to carry his board, but he wants to carry. Well, that's our Brazilian. The Brazilian crossing the finish line. All right, here we go, another battle. That's the polar bear on the right. Christian Anderson and trying to make out the number on the starboard on the left. And what a solid set. I mean, for them to get an actual wave all the way in, for our paddlers also coming around from the outside. Well, this is what we were hoping for, at least Boothy and T2 wanted. They wanted that wave to come in. But see that it just fizzles out. The tide is just too high on the inside here at La Ocho. 135 counting into this heat. An hour and 35 minutes. An hour 32 was the winning time for Shrimpy. And nice strong paddles here to see who will finish. That's number 41. We can tell you that's uh, Christian Anderson on the left, but on the inside it looks like maybe that's 166 Aaron Sanchez. And the leash has come off as Sanchez hits the sand and runs up for Team Spain. Denmark just behind with Christian Anderson. So that's sixth and seventh place. 42 now. Number 40. There we go. Possibly Team Mexico. We got different numbers for our Mexican paddlers. And more to come. And this is a great race. Here we go, it's El Degado. Now coming in for Team Peru Finishing. in ninth place. And there is Hunter Fluger. Still making his way out to the orange can to make a left-hand turn out into the ocean. And that'll be the front of our prone paddle racers. And look at the distance that he put on Julian. And this is exactly what Candace Appleby, gold medalist, was in the booth sharing with us. That Hunter was going to want to take that front position, that lead position coming into the open ocean, coming from Maui. No, and he, he would want to be in this leading position because he is so comfortable in winds and conditions like this. He lives in my neighborhood. He lives in Hawaii, Kaya on Oahu. All right, let's go down to the boat and check in with Drew in the action. Uh, we're coming to you live from the boat right now. Some exciting action as you come around Fiji Rock here, an absolutely iconic location. You can see the swell really starting to build and these distant ra racers finally getting a little reprieve as they catch that final bump all the way in. And you see him get a little bit wobbly because yes, there is a little bit of wave swell out here, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, yeah, that, it's been a very exciting race so far. That's Javier Gomez coming across and from Mexico now making his way around. And you can see the crosswell kind of hit him there, but wow, what a distance race today. Give it to the man from Japan, Trippy Araki guy. I mean, we, absolutely incredible how he performed, but boy, the conditions, ladies and gentlemen, have been absolutely stellar for this distance race. You had a lot of current through the channel, a nice little downwinder with plenty of bumps to push through and we're waiting for our first prones to come into picture, and it looks like they just are now coming around Fiji Rock, and it looks like Team USA Hunter Fluger is out in front. 
If you pan to the left there, you can see him just in front of the second place competitor. So let's see if Hunter Pfluger, it will come down to the surf on the way in if he can hold on to this over Yulin Montrecarena. So a lot of action still to come. I'll let you guys call the finish of this prone paddleboard race as they make their way around. Back to you guys. Thanks so much, Drew. And I know uh, Hunter's dad, Alan Fluger, he's going to be happy, stoked, excited that his son is now a three-time world champion. And unfortunately, we didn't get to see the breakaway between him and Julian, but um, I'm sure we're going to hear it in the interviews. Yeah, what an incredible performance, though, that Hunter has put in. And to go three in a row, that is insane for any athlete in any discipline to go three years back to back on top for him to walk away with his third gold medal now for team usa is very exciting and he's just starting to round fiji island and we have also received confirmation as you were looking there that we have never seen a sup distance and technical race winners in the same year before on the isa side for the men Candace Appleby taking it on the women's side uh, in previous years. But for Shrimpy, it's a very first in ISA history to see a male win in the sub distance racing and in the sub technical racing. Yeah, I was just trying to rack my brains. I've been to most of these events, not all of the events, but uh, following the history and the placings of all of our competitors. I remember Jordan Mercer has done it multiple times. And Candace Appleby did it and saw Yolita in 2015 down in Mexico. but. Now, Shrimpy has done it here in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and we're going to welcome with big open arms right here, Hunter Fluger stroking in. He can see the finish line. He'll be competing coming up tomorrow in the prone technical race. Let's see if he can do the double-double as he's got a little bump with him. We're trying to make out who the uh, competitor next to him on the starboard is. We can't really see his number from here, but our attention is to Hunter Fluger. And they will share a bump to get themselves in here. And what a moment of relief. They've been paddling for almost two hours. Well, for the, for the paddleboarders, they're...